Friends, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, our food system is broken. If it was a glass vase, it would be lying shattered at my feet. I'm going to tell you a bit about why it's broken, and more importantly, what we can do to fix it. I'm going to bore you with some numbers, but just not, not just numbers. The first shocking statistic, and I've been doing this for quite a while, is that nearly one in two people on this planet are malnourished. The, the images that we, we've just seen are one set of extremes. But when you put together the severe wasting, the severe stunting, anemia, um, vitamin A deficiency, overweight, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, you put all that stuff together, you get about one in two people on this planet is malnourished, and no country is, is, is exempt from that problem. The country we're in right now, 66% of the population is overweight, a third is obese, 15% is anemic. It's extraordinary. So no country on this planet has a monopoly on the problem of malnutrition, and no country on this planet has a monopoly on the solutions. We're in a very different world than we were just 15 years ago. Just give you some of the kind of boring statistics, but they're important. This is a number you might see a lot. There was just a report out by the Rome UN agencies last week that said, actually, this number is no longer 800 million. These are people going to bed hungry every night. This has gone up 30 million in the last year. So that, that's the number you hear about a lot. Here's another number that you may hear about, the two billion that don't get enough iron or vitamin A or vitamin D or zinc. They're deficient in some kind of vitamin or mineral. And that number has been static for the last 20 years. Not, not going up, but not going down. And then you've got this other massive kind of freight train coming down the track, which is overweight and obesity, 1.9 billion. And there's an overlap because overweight or obese folks can be uh, deficient in micronutrients and minerals, right? So when you, no one's actually put all of that together, but if you do some rough calculations, you get about three to three and a half billion people with one of these conditions. And so that's nearly one in two on this planet. But numbers, um, the, so, so these, why does this matter? It matters because there's, an, there's a, a big mortality risk and a big morbidity risks, risk. Um, how does this all add up? This just came out last week in The Lancet, or maybe the week before last in The Lancet. It's the latest estimate of the global burden of disease. So there are some folks in Seattle and all around the world at WHO, they put together all the mortality data around the world from all causes, all the morbidity data, and they scrunch it up into one number called Disability Adjusted Life Years, or DALIs. I'm sure you're familiar with them, many of you. And then they say, OK, what are the risk factors that generate all of this stuff? And they rank the top 10, and here are the top 10. And six of them, the ones in dark red, are all diet-related. So the food system is broken. It's generating masses, amounts, masses of amounts of malnutrition. And this malnutrition is having incredibly corrosive effect on individuals, on communities, families, and nations, and ultimately, the world. This is, so numbers move some people, and they, they move me. Uh, I'm an economist. I, I grew up on numbers. But the reason I got into this whole area was because of some, just a visit uh, that I went uh, in, my, in my early 20s to India and, and saw some kids that were just, I couldn't believe how malnourished they were. I couldn't believe what they looked like. I couldn't believe the conditions they lived in. I couldn't believe that this condition could persist for so long. And one of the things that really struck me very early on was a, was a statistic that I, I heard which is that at birth, a baby's brain weighs half a kilo, right? And obviously, the baby's brain grows, and neurons develop, and synapses form, and you know, all, of this, all of it thickens. And at one, month, at one year of age, the baby's brain 
weighs about a kilo. So you go from half a kilo at birth to a kilo at one year of age. The adult brain weighs 1.4 kilos. So from year one to year 57, um, I've only added 0.4 of a kilo. Some people would be surprised that I've even added that much. <laughs> right? So from, from conception through to that first year of life, 70% of the brain infrastructure is being developed. And any insult in that period, whether it's poor diet or infection, is catastrophic to that child's life chances. Now, the food system. What is the food system? It's a horrible term. It means, basically, it's very simple. Everything that, from the nutrients in the ground that are then propagated into food, food is then stored, transported, harvested, processed, um, sold, marketed, consumed, and hopefully not too much of it is wasted. That's the food system. And there are multiple food systems that operate in every country, actually. Um, there are lots of campaigns to save our broken food system. And I said the food system is broken. Why do I think it's broken? The first reason is we create the demand for healthy food in a really terribly boring way, right? You may not think it living here. As I walk from Tottenham Court tube station to, to the building here, you see, what is it, organic? What's that big store over there? Um, Globe, what is it called? Planet organic. Planet organic. I was like, wow, that's amazing. Um, so, but in general, we create the demand for healthy foods really badly. We, when we do create the demand, most people actually can't afford healthy food. I'll give you some pretty shocking statistics on that. And then finally, governments don't make it very easy for people to buy healthy food. They don't make it very easy sometimes for businesses to do the right thing for healthy food. So I'm going to talk about how we can do better on those three dimensions. So the first thing is, whether you live in this shanty town in Cape Town, or whether you occupy, and I haven't put these two pictures together, this is a picture, whether you, whether you frequent this fancy golf course on the left, we need to revolutionize the way we think about creating the demand for healthy food. So there's a highly scientific picture of the brain. The uh, left brain is, um, I'm a kind of left brain person, very uh, driven by numbers and very kind of linear and logical. Um, my family wouldn't say that, but I, I, I protest I am this kind of person. Um, and, you know, and this is a classic public health behavior change programs. You should eat this food because it's really good for you, and you should eat it, and I don't know why you're not eating it because it's really good for you, so please eat it. Um, on the right side of the brain is all the other stuff, the aspiration, the emotion, the colors, the music, the language, the craving, the desirability, the deliciousness. And I go to lots of nutrition meetings all over the world. I never hear the word delicious, ever, at any nutrition meeting. Why would anyone eat healthy food if it's not delicious, right? Businesses are absolutely brilliant at this kind of stuff. They make you eat food you didn't even know you wanted. They make you buy things you didn't even know you wanted. We need hybrid approaches. We need to bring the best of the science from the public sector and the best of the disruptive processes from business. I've been traveling for 35 years on planes a lot. And uh, I've, maybe the first couple of times I ever got on a plane, I listened to the public service announcement on safety. After that, I've just tuned it out completely. But just last month, I was on a plane and it was a British Airways plane, and they had this great new food safety, uh, this great new um, safety video, which is lots of um, celebrities. So that's that's not why I paid attention to it. I paid attention to it because it has incredible amounts of humour. Basically, people taking the piss, excuse me, out of themselves and out of the whole process of how formal it is. And we need that kind of. Um, we need that kind of disruptive messaging around creating the demand for healthy food. So here's an example of some of the work that my organization has been doing in Indonesia. It's called the Healthy Gossip Campaign. We, we've teamed up with some media companies and some TV companies and brought in some public sector folks from the government. And together they've come up with a one-minute uh, video about, around a healthy gossip campaign. And it's about the, it's about the village gossip. Um, who happens to be a woman, but men are just as gossipy as women, we know that, um, talking and being, being very judgmental and very critical of um, all her neighbors and friends, uh, the way in which she, they feed their kids. 
And it's very funny and very humorous. And by the end of the minute, it turns out she's the one who's, the really, who's not very clued in about how to feed your kids. And the, the traction has been, the uptake has been huge. The, the viewing numbers and the, and the talking about this campaign has been huge. So that's usually where the story ends. But we commissioned uh, an Australian university to actually figure out if this has had an impact. So here's a rather techy slide. It shows um, in four districts in Indonesia, this is a group that was exposed to the uh, ads, and this is a group that wasn't exposed. So there's a control group and a treatment group. They're very similar at the baseline, which is the 47 and the 45. This is kids who have uh, diets that are adequate in nutrients. At the end of the two-year exposure, um, the gap is 14%. Not as big as we would like, but there's a, there's a definite impact of this intervention. So effective behavior change is rare, but if you get it right, it can be very powerful because it's contagious. It can get people talking about things. It can change the way we think about things. It can change norms. Second thing we need to do is drive down the cost of healthy diets. Um, my clicker is not working. There. I was in a, um, I was in a, um, in Mozambique, working with one of the businesses. We work with businesses to help them get the price of healthy foods down. I was in this guy's, um, this small business's office, and I said, what's that, what's that picture on the wall? I took a photo of it, and this is the picture. And he said, that's our business plan. We want to get the price from here down to here. That's, that was the business plan. Why is that business plan so important? Here's a study that came out um, last year, Lancet Global Health. It's looking at these four countries on the right, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and uh, Zimbabwe. And it said, how much would it cost those families to purchase five fruits and vegetables a day? You and I can purchase five fruits and vegetables a day, no problem. We could probably purchase 50 if we wanted to, right? No problem. Um, it turns out that these families, would, it would take 52% of their income to purchase five fruits and vegetables a day. And these are five fruits and vegetables a day that are available and normally consumed in the context that these families were living in. So they just simply can't afford to do it. So we have been working with businesses in uh, Kenya and Mozambique around healthy and safe foods. And again, an independent evaluation of those programs. We provide small grants and TA and business advice. Uh, has shown in three of the four, we are helping firms, small, medium enterprises in the countries, increase their market share and drive down the price. And the final thing to do is enable businesses to do positive things for nutrition. Businesses are part and a big part of the problem in the food system, a big part. But if we're going to turn the food system around, they have to be a big part of the solution. And this picture is, you know, we have to create fertile ground for them to do the right thing, make it easier for them to do the right thing, and harder for them to do the bad things. I'm going to give you one example of how we have been working with the government of Pakistan to make it easier for businesses to do the right thing. So in Pakistan, um, not much food, not much staple food, so things like wheat flour is fortified, and if you add iron and zinc to wheat flour, you're helping uh, families, because they consume this stuff, uh, a lot of this stuff. You're helping families get more nutrients in the diet. But it's really difficult for businesses to pick this up if it's going to cost them a lot more. And the government of Pakistan was putting a sales tax on uh, the stuff you add to wheat flour, the fortificant you add to, to make this stuff have more iron and zinc. So we did a very, uh, I think, very sophisticated political economy analysis. We did an analysis of all the parliamentarians that were going to be involved in passing a law to reduce or even exempt this fortificant from the sales tax. And then we targeted those, those politicians with, with key messages about why this was a good thing to, to exempt the sales tax. And this is the budget document. This is the cover of the document in, in Pakistan uh, of their 2017 budget. On page 14 of that document, you can see this. It's proposed to provide an exemption from sales tax on premixes, which is the stuff you add to the wheat flour, to fight growth stunting. I've never seen the words growth stunting, fight growth stunting, in a budget document before. So for us, this may not seem terribly exciting to you, but for us, this was incredibly exciting because it means that millions of people are able to get fortified um, wheat flour. So 
My final slide, friends, is perhaps the most powerful thing we can do to change food systems is not the demand stuff so much, it's not the business stuff so much, and it's not the enabling environment stuff, although that's important. It's actually to ask the right question. Uh, we're in a university. I used to head up the IDS at Sussex, and I, I always told my colleagues, we need to spend half our time figuring out what's the right question to ask, and then the other half figuring out what, how, what's the answer. But very often, we don't spend enough time figuring out what's the right question to ask. I hear this question a lot. How are we going to feed the world uh, by 2030? And of course, these two foods on the right, rice and hamburgers, they'll do a fine job of filling stomachs. But what you fill, I mean, and of course, people who don't have full stomachs need their stomachs to be filled. But the right question to be asked is what needs to happen to nourish the world as well as feed it, right? That's the right question. And we need to get policy people, we need to get businesses, we need to get schools, we need to get local leaders, we need to get community mobilizers, we need to get families thinking, not just how can I feed my child, yes, of course that's important, but am I doing enough, or could I be doing more, or could I, in a min as a mayor, or could I, as a, um, a municipal leader, or could I, as a minister of health, or could I, as a procurement officer in a supermarket, or, or could I, as a journalist, could I, as a civil society organization, be doing more to nourish the world? That's what needs to ha be happen. We need to build demand. We need to lower the price of healthy food. And we need to support responsible businesses and call out irresponsible businesses. That's what GAIN works on. Please join us. Thank you.